So I'm here to talk to you about communication barriers today, and I start with language barriers. So a language barrier is essentially what happens when um, the language of an institution and the language repertoires of the people who need to interact with that institution, who are stakeholders in that institution, when those language choices of the institution and the repertoires of the stakeholders don't match. Simple example, ISD, this conference is being conducted in English. If you don't speak English, this is not for you. You're excluded. Um, now that's sort of an unsurprising example, but language barriers have real life consequences. And let me just give you three real life consequences from um, media reports that I've collected over the past couple of weeks. So um, the first example you see here was in the news last Friday. This is um, a news item from the media in Iran and it said that 50,000 children failed the first year of primary education in Iran last year. And you go like, my God, how can these poor little kids, they're five year old, how can you actually fail first grade? And how can 50,000 kids first fail first grade? That's 3% of the Iranian for year one primary school population. And the explanation for that is that these kids come from provinces where Persian is not the dominant language. They may be from Turkish speaking backgrounds, Kurdish speaking backgrounds, Arabic speaking backgrounds, Baluchi speaking backgrounds, but their education, their classrooms is entirely in Persian. So that's a language barrier with real life consequences because if you fail year one, I don't think you have a bright educational future ahead of you. Second example, also uh, two weeks ago or last, and very recent, takes you to the US, to the dairy lands of Dakota. And dairy lands means essentially, um, like many of us, we don't actually know where our food comes from, but um, food very often is produced by migrant workforce and they're essential to the Australian food production workforce as they are in the US. Um, this is a, a tragic story of um, the father and son you see here. The, they come from Nicaragua. Um, father was working on a dairy farm and the little son got run over in a tractor accident, died in the injury. When the police came to record the accident, they actually, um, took away the father because they assumed that the father had actually been the driver of the tractor and had killed his own son. It emerged that um, later on through activist interventions that actually the father was just there on the scene. He had no involvement in the accident, just trying to save his son. And um, his heartache was compounded by the language barrier that no one actually understood that um, you know, he hadn't been the perpetrator. And the third example, that's a bit older, a couple of months ago, um, takes you to Australia. Also a fatal example, the young woman you see here in the wheelchair, her name was Dua Ali. She passed away in Blacktown Hospital. For those of you who are not from Sydney, Blacktown is um, one of our Western suburbs. The, this young woman was um, suffering from Turner syndrome, which is, um, um, a chromosomal disorder, which often also leads to intellectual disability. And so she was in her 20s pre-verbal. And whenever she had to go to hospital, she communicated through her mother because her mother was her closest carer and could communicate with her. The mother, however, doesn't speak any English. Mother is um, from Pakistan, speaks Urdu and Punjabi. And so the usual arrangement for the family was that Dua Ali and her mother and the brother or father would go to hospital and the, the brother or the father who you can see here in the picture would then translate 
between or interpret between the mother and the hospital staff. In this case, um, that was in early 2022 during the COVID lockdowns, there were restrictions on how many family members can actually enter hospital or could enter the emergency ward. And um, so the brother wasn't allowed in, it was just the mother and um, the woman. And she was sent home with, was misdiagnosed. Um, her aortic dissection was misdiagnosed as um, food poisoning and um, she passed away. So these are three examples of language barriers having real life consequences. The key point I'm making is language barriers are about the exclusion of people from education, from fair and equitable access to the law, from healthcare, the list could go on, employment, all other forms of social participation. So what I want to do in this lecture now is actually look at how language barriers are constituted, how they are negotiated in law and what institutions do to mitigate language barriers and the recognized problems that um, I've just introduced you to. Okay, so um, let's start with a brief overview how the legal system actually deals with language barriers. What kind of laws are there to protect vulnerable people who do not, whose language repertoire does not match that of the institution? And I'll start with um, language legislation in the United States, which probably has the best language access legislation in the world. And um, there are language access rights in the US or have been since the late 1960s as part of the civil rights movement and specifically schools have been um, required or and also, you know, I mean, it's, it's a very complicated legal system and I, I'm very much simplifying here because there are federal and state laws and, and various different laws and whatnot. But the big overview is there are language access rights and they apply if the consti constituents of a particular institution, there are at least 10% from a particular language background other than English, then that institution must provide services in that language. Or if um, the institution receives any federal money federal funding through like healthcare, for instance, then they actually must provide language access services to anyone who requires them. Implementation is a bit patchy and um, they provide these language access rights for um, limited English proficient people. The abbreviation is LEP and many linguists have noted that this sounds a bit like LEPA. Um, the European Union or Europe also has pretty good language rights legislation. The, um, in the European Convention on Human Rights, it's a right to interpretation for anyone who cannot understand or speak the language is actually enshrined in the convention, has been enshrined since the 1950s. Now that sounds fantastic, but before you get too excited, there are two, um, two limitations on that. One limitation is that access right or these rights interpretation actually only applies to indigenous minority languages or autochthonous languages, but not to migrant languages. So we have situations like um, last week, again, news report last week in Wales, a woman gets fined with a traffic violation and um, the fine that is issued to her is only issued in English. So she debates the fine because it is not issued in Wales, which is a, and in Welsh, excuse me, which is a protected language. And um, the fine is actually rescinded because her language rights were violated. Now, you can think whatever you think about that, but this woman was, of course, perfectly bilingual in English and Welsh and kind of 
it seems a bit like a, a cop out, if you will. Whereas if um, uh, per, and there are many more monolingual speakers of Punjabi, Bengali, Sileti, um, migrant languages in the UK, they would not have been able to get out of their traffic violation and fine because their languages are not protected in this way. Um, the other the other um, limitation on the right to interpretation, other than that it is usually restricted to the autochthonous or indigenous languages, which are really, I mean, minoritarian in comparison to the migrant languages, um, is that only in criminal law cases can any, is anyone required to have the right to interpretation. So if you are a defendant in a criminal law case, then you have a right to interpretation regardless of your language background. So that's the European Union. Now Australia, what do you think what's going on in Australia? Um, in Australia, we don't actually have anything sort of big federally mandated. We have a whole range of procedural guidelines to engage interpreters. So the common law, which is the overarching legal framework in Australia, does not recognize a right to interpretation. However, um, there are lots of procedural guidelines for um, parents who need to access schools, for patients who have the Australian Patients Health Rights Charter and so on and so forth. And all those various procedural guidelines particularly in the healthcare sector, but also in the legal sector and to um, a lesser extent in the education sector, provide for the possibility or the requirement to have an interpreter for people who are not fluent in English or who need an interpreter. So to sum up this particular slide and language in law, there is actually um, considerable momentum internationally for language access rights it has been gaining ground in the US since the 1960s in the Europe, Europe, the European Convention on Human Rights dates from the 1950s. However, um, more recently, the, um, the kind of procedural guidelines and, and the funding guidelines, they really are 21st century developments in most cases. Um, there is another kind of policy discourse or media space that influences how the public thinks about language barriers. And that is really the context of the pandemic over the past couple of years during COVID. Um, language barriers as experienced by linguistic minorities have certainly gained visibility. And um, myself and members of the Language on the Move team have actually also been part of that media space. Um, the URL I've got here for you is um, the Language on the Move COVID-19 archives, and I've got the front page of our special issue um, co-edited with Jenny Shang about um, linguistic diversity in a time of crisis. So um, I won't really go into that detail. I just want to say we have um, momentum in law and internationally, and we have public momentum around language access rights because during the pandemic all kinds of language barriers and problems really hit the media to a larger degree than was the case before. So there is a global momentum towards language rights at the moment and um, we also are in the decade of international languages as you know declared by the UNESCO. So what I want to do in the remainder of this presentation is ask about so how are these implemented? How does this work in practice? And um, I want to conclude by saying, what can we as linguists contribute to actually improve the bridging of language barriers? Okay, let's start with um, a bit of implementation. So the first challenge, if you are an institution and you want to provide language access rights, you actually need to identify who of your stakeholders need some sort of language support, right? I'm mostly focusing on examples from health in the, in the next part of the section. So 
as a healthcare provider, how do you actually A, identify the people who need language support? Let me give you an example how they do it in the US. This is um, uh, a sign from the University of New Mexico Health System. Can you identify the problem with identifying a language barrier in this way? <laughs> well, I see you laughing, so <laughs> you obviously um, see what the problem is. If, you know, if I want to find out whether you don't speak English, it seems reasonable to ask, well, do you speak English or don't you speak English? It's that if you don't speak <laughs> if you speak English, then um, you won't understand. And now some people kind of think, well, this like, don't you speak English? Do you speak English? That's so trivial and so basic, like everyone in the world really understands that. Let me just give you um, a, a little anecdote of an example. Uh, not so long ago, I was traveling to Germany. I was arriving at the airport. Um, and going through immigration. Now, usually I, I travel on a German passport, so that's a very privileged passport, and you just usually go through the automated gates, but the automated gates weren't working. So I was there with the, the hoi polloi of all the people from all over who, um, you know, do not necessarily travel on a privileged passport. And so in front of me, there was a woman from Iran and um, the immigration officer was trying to find out which language she speaks. So the immigration officer was asking her in English, what's your language? And she goes, Germany. So the officer goes again, what's your language? Just a bit louder, so in case, you know, this is like a hearing problem, what's your language? And she goes, Germany, because apparently she was like thinking, you know, I wanna get into Germany or whatever she was thinking, I have no idea. And so um, then, the officer kind of shouts out to the crowd, anyone here who can interpret? And then when someone in the crowd shouts, which language? <laughs> and, he, and he goes, Arabic. And at, that, and at that point, I kind of couldn't contain myself anymore and I go in German to the officer. She's from Iran and she's speaking Persian. So he goes, can you interpret? <laughs> As an academic, I, I should have said no, because my Persian is nowhere in that space. However, as a human being, I actually don't know what you want to know. And he only wanted to know, what are you doing in Germany? And um, how long are you going to stay? Two questions which are within my Persian proficiency. So I was able to interpret and resolve that particular language barrier. But um, the point here is that even a simple word like language is not necessarily comprehensible if you don't actually speak the language. Okay, so here is um, one example. Now let's see how we do it in Australia, how we identify people who need language support in Australia. And um, the example here is from the reception of a clinic in Sydney. I acknowledge Bryn Quick, one of our HDR students and also volunteers in the conference who collected this particular example. So this is the reception area of the clinic. And you can see yourself kind of coming into the clinic and presumably you'll focus on the check-in here sign because A, that's big and um, it's also there three times and it has arrows. If you look around a bit more, you might focus on um, the various flu signs or the TV, which is set to some commercial channel, it's very unlikely that you actually, you know, concentrate your attention on that part where I've just drawn a red circle around. I mean, that looks like very small print. So let's move in a bit closer. If you move in a bit closer, you can actually see that this is a language identification card. And if you move in a bit more, at this point, I don't know whether you can read it. And now let me just say, um, although I'm not the, the addressee of a card like that, 
I have something in common with all many addressees of a card like that. And that commonality is that I'm very short-sighted. Now, what does short-sighted have to do with language barriers or with not being able to speak English? Well, there is no causal relationship, let me assure you, between the ability to, or between being short-sighted and speak a language. However, most of the people in Australia who um, do not speak English actually are very elderly. And um, short-sightedness, I've been short-sightedness all my life, but um, short-sightedness is also a condition of older age. So we are looking at just also another practical barrier, just like um, Catherine told us yesterday about like hearing health is becomes translated into a language and literacy problem because of the way you can access language if you have particular impairments. So let's move in a bit closer. So let's say you've overcome your short sightedness, you've overcome the distractions of all the other signs, your short sightedness, and you've really gone up to the language identification card, and you are the one client who's going to point. What's the next problem you're having? So th there are like 70 languages there, a bit over 70 languages. And I've now only been. The, the instructions will say, please point to your language. We will arrange an interpreter at no charge. And that's there in all the other languages now. So it's translated into 70 plus languages. The next problem you're going to have is actually find your language because among 72 languages, how do you actually find your language? What's the, what's the organization? I've put up Farsi or Persian there. What's the organizing principle for the languages here? English, the English alphabet, the Latin alphabet. So it's organized by the language name in English, sort order of the Latin alphabet. Now, again, that may seem like trivial. However, if you don't speak English, or if you come from a background where the Latin alphabet is not drilled into you from the age of three or something, or if you actually don't know the name of your language in English, or as is the case here, sometimes have your language name under F because sometimes your language name is Farsi, and sometimes you have it under P because some people think your language name is Persian. Same goes for Chinese, by the way, that's sometimes under C for Chinese simplified, sometimes under S for simplified Chinese, and sometimes under M for Mandarin. So point is, it's actually really hard to find your language there. So this language identification card is really meant very well, but in a sense, it's exactly the opposite of asking someone in English, do you speak English? It's complete information overload in the other languages. So many languages, it's actually not useful either. Now, let me just give you some more of these implementation problems. So, First problem is how can I actually get um, a language service in another language? How does the institution identify? Now let's say the institution has identified the Persian speakers. And let me give you an example here. Because what we get then is low quality translations. Second problem. So um, this is an example of a sign that was widely printed and distributed digitally in um, neighborhoods of Melbourne during the Melbourne lockdown when, um, you know, during the Melbourne lockdown. And so there are two, uh, two signs there. The one I want you to focus on, or the one that is the original, is the one around which I've got um, a red square. So that's the original. The other one is just there for your convenience. So the one that's only in English, 
I've scanned it through Google Translate and I only put it there for your convenience. So no one put that up. I'm just using it so that I can explain to you how this is actually a terrible translation. Um, so if you concentrate for a second on the right hand of the screen, the Google Translate, the Google Translate says, if a resident of the metropolis, Mitchell, Melbourne, Shire you must wear, a face mask when leaving home. Now, I guess you can sort of gather that this is, you must wear a face mask, but it's also pretty incomprehensible in many ways. And this is not because Google Translate is bad. Google Translate is actually not too bad. Um, this is actually because and this was a real, this is done by a real life translator, not, it's not automated translation. This is because the translation is so poor. And part of that problem is um, the mixing of the Persian script, the Arabic script, if you will, Persian is written in the Arabic script, which has right to left directionality and the Latin alphabet, which has left to right directionality. So I've just shown this as I've put in little arrows to show you how this works. So you start reading in the first line, right to left, then you need to jump to Melbourne, right in the middle of the next line, to read from left to right. And then once you're at the end of Melbourne, you jump back to the middle where and, because this is about Melbourne and Mitchell Shire, where <laughs> or is in, uh, right to left directionality. So now you're at the L of Mitchell, but you're jumping over to the M and then you go back right, right to left. Then you jump down, jump down to Shire, go again from left to right, and then you jump back to the Persian. So this is very confusing. And I'm just showing this to you to show, this is poor translation. Okay, it's translated, it's there, but basically only to fulfill um, legal requirement. Ultimately, the communication is not sufficient. And now let's just look at this bit down there where um, you sort of see words like in the Google Translate, apostasy, continuity, soy, on us, protect. And, if you're a conspiracy theorist, this is like mind control, some subliminal messages being projected. Um, the Victorian government was not projecting subliminal messages through their Persian translation. Can you guess what's going on? You know what? This in the original is actually another language. It's actually Arabic. So it's not even Persian. So they couldn't actually be bothered to have that particular bit of quality control that you actually check what other languages this is in. And so it's like, you know, it's like giving you a sign in English and plonking in some German because, you know, oh, it's the same alphabet, so surely it can't be that different. Okay, so let's move on from the low quality translations and I'll jump over that um, and give you one more example before I get to the conclusion and to allow you some time for questions. This is an example actually from Peru. I've got examples from Australia, but this is starker actually. What we have here is also a COVID example translated into Quechua Chanka, one of the minority languages of Peru. The Peruvian government was right out at the front foot, if you will, in terms of translations at the beginning of the pandemic and they provided translations on how to protect yourself. And this is very early in the pandemic. This was still when we were hand washing before we were, before we knew this is a, an airborne virus. And um, so they were really on the front foot with their languages and translated their information into all the 16 official indigenous languages 
of Peru. I don't actually speak Quechua Chanka. Um, the example is by one of our master students, Alexandra Hermoso Cavero, and um, the, her whole analysis is published on Language of the Moose. You've got the link there or the reference there. Let me just give you two of the translations. Um, number two said, use plenty of water to wash your hands. Number four says, rinse your hands with plenty of water. Number six says, turn off the faucet with the paper towel, towel you just used to dry your hands. Now, what am I going on here? Why am I saying this is not such a great translation? To understand that you need to know a bit about Peru. So, um, the population in Peru of people who are monolingual in Quechua Chanka have very low levels of literacy. Because if you have a bit of education in Peru, you actually become bilingual and learn Spanish. So, this is a translated poster targeted at a low literacy population. That's one of the problems. The second problem is that that small segment of the population who is monolingual in Quechua Chanka and needs information in Quechua Chanka. They live in the highlands of Peru. They're part of the most disadvantaged population and they don't actually have running water. So um, this whole idea of you wash your hands under a faucet with running water is completely irrelevant. It's like you know adding insult to injury or um, something. And um, so what we've what I've shown to you in terms of examples of um, language access provisions is that there is a lot of overwhelming content because it's very multilingual. It's often organized by monolingual logics like the um, English alphabet or the Latin alphabet. Its um, translations are often really low quality if they are provided, regardless of whether they are translated by humans or whether they are translated by Google Translate or some other add in that's now available on many of the government websites. And um, if the translations are available, it's like this blanket translations. It's the same information for everyone, regardless of whether that information is relevant to the target speakers. The result of all that is that people who experience a language barrier tune out of that information. We've, this comes from um, an interview study with parents during COVID and um, the quote here. And um, what we saw over and over again, the study was done by um, a couple of collaborators, Vera and Shiva, who isn't here, and um, a couple of other people. And it's about information overload. It's about breakdown of trust. So many people said to us things like, you know, there was so much information. We got so many emails. I had no idea what was important or not. I just scanned. I don't pay attention. And that's exactly what happens. If you have like 70 languages to choose from, you don't pay attention, particularly if you don't, if you can't even see them. They're so small print. Um, if the translation is so terrible and if part of it is actually not your language because someone just couldn't be bothered to you know do some basic quality checks you're not paying attention if the translation tells you to wash your hands with running water if or under the faucet if you don't have running water in your district then you're not paying attention so um that's actually exacerbating language barriers now, what do people actually want? And I, um, can I have another five minutes? Is that okay in terms of time? Five? Okay. So what do patients want? Um, together with colleagues from Western Sydney Health and um, again, Vera, we were asking patients who experience the language barriers from um, Kurdish language backgrounds, Arabic language backgrounds and Sudanese, Arabic language backgrounds, it turned out the Sudanese Arabic 
backgrounds were all from Sudanese, from other languages. We asked them, what kind of support do you want? A, none of them said, we want more posters. So um, that just didn't come up. None of them said we want professional translators either. What they wanted was actually family. One woman said, my husband, I want my husband to be there because I trust him and he can keep a secret. Now, um, interpreters, as Jean will, um, one of our resident sociolinguists of interpreting will tell you, uh, interpreters in Australia are bound by a strict code of conduct and confidentiality is of course part of the code of conduct. So patients don't often know that. They don't know that the interpreters are going to be bound by a code of conduct. They say, oh, well, who knows what's going around in our community. We are often talking very small communities. Um, another one said, I want my husband because he interprets into our local Sudanese Arabic. And that was another problem that oftentimes the assigned interpreters were speaking another variety of Arabic that they couldn't understand. Um, I want my daughter because she has time and is patient with me. Healthcare is so rushed. And if you need an interpreter, you know, there's even less time to pay attention to you. Um, another one said, my son, because I can ask him anytime when needed and he will help. And, then there was someone who wanted like the dancing unicorn. She said, I want a female bilingual health staff who speaks my accent. And by accent, I she means speaks my language. And um, I don't think this should be the dancing unicorn. This should actually be what we have in our healthcare system. If we have a diverse healthcare system, then the people in the institution need to be bi and multilingual too, and they need to be able to use their languages. At the moment, they are often prevented from using any languages that we have, and they're kind of discouraged. Because now let me give you the other side of this coin. As part of this study, we also interviewed healthcare service providers. And so we said, how often does a client request a family member to interpret? One healthcare provider said 80% of times, so pretty much all the time. But then she goes on, and that happens. I inform them that we are unable to use family members and need to access a professional interpreter. And so there's actually the whole legal framework again, that this is really about um, protecting themselves from lawsuits and protecting their legal requirements. So um, she's not for her. she's you know, not able to um, actually act on the wishes of the clients, but then the professional interpreter must come in. Except we've also learned in the study that professional interpreters are often very difficult to come by because um, they're not available, they're not available in the right language, they're in the wrong spot, they can't be accessed at the time needed, and so on and so forth. So we asked, what happens if no professional interpreter is available? And now listen to this. We cancel the session. So that's actually the worst outcome that you can have as an implementation of language access rights. Because no longer do you have poor communication, you have no communication at all. Essentially, you are denying or deferring, postponing the medical appointment to some other time. Okay, now Lloyd tells me one more minute. Let me just see, um, I just jumped. Oh no, I don't jump this because this is so interesting. So um, no, I'll, I'll let you to ask questions about this if you wanna hear about that. So um, let, me, oh, come on. let me go to my conclusion. My conclusion was going to be, and I'll bring this up all at once, that in my book, Linguistic Diversity and Social Justice, I draw on you know, a long tradition from since the Greeks, that justice is not some kind of abstract ideal where everyone is equal. It's the overcoming of injustice. Very often, the abstract ideal of justice is held against language rights because we get, 
oh, you know, if we can't service like each of our 600 languages, then we shouldn't privilege like Chinese where there are a fair number of them. We shouldn't privilege the larger. If like, you know, if we can't give it to everyone, then let's, let's bridge language barriers for no one. And so that kind of ideal is actually being held against improvement. So I think it's very important to think about justice as overcoming of injustice. And um, we see a couple of misdiagnoses really in these, uh, in the ways in which language barriers are being bridged. One of them is very much related to everything that Ophelia yesterday said, um, the, the logics of named languages, which influences us so much in, in your case, it was about um, how we denigrate the repertoires of multilingual kids. Um, but the um, logics of named languages also create another barrier in that they are just one language is equal to the not everyone, everything is the same. And we all do it in the same way. And just as long as we multiply consistently translations and interpretations, then that creates justice. That's um, certainly not the case, doesn't overcome barriers. And um, I also want to speak against the individual misdiagnosis, because that's something that's also so fundamental to us as linguists, that we have this methodological individualism and that um, we only talk about the language of the individuals. We don't really think about communities. We don't think about families who um, kind of need to face this world together and often interact with institutions together. Again, being reminded of what Ophelia yesterday said about um, we only see such a tiny part of multiling the lives of multilingual people if we are constrained by our lenses. And, and methodological individualism is another constraining lens I would like to add. So I, I would like to say, you know, language is a distributed resource. And now I'm finally done, um, except that um, I just want to say, I'm going to say more about this together with my co-authors, about the language barriers that people experience in real life, such as Roxana, who said, I often feel in Australia like I have a big lock on my lips. And that's in the workshop on life in a new language in a half hour. Thank you.